Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And this is our Halloween podcast. And we're going to be reviewing last year's Halloween video on Jack-O-Lantern. First, one little thing. We just wanted to mention the two new Twitter accounts that we created recently. One is Humcom Videos, and the other is Humcom Casters. That's H-U-M-C-O-M-M, like Humanities Communications. That's what it's short for. I apologize for the horrible portmanteaus. And these are two Twitter accounts to try to build community among those who do podcasts on humanities topics or videos on humanities topics. If you're interested in finding more podcasts similar to ours, perhaps, you could search the hashtag Humanities Podcasts. If you're interested in more videos on history and other humanities-oriented topics, you could search the hashtag HumComVids. And if you have a podcast or do videos on those topics, if you use those hashtags, those uh, Twitter accounts will retweet you and other people might retweet you as well. All right, that was the only piece of business we had to get to. So the first thing we should talk about is, of course, our cocktails. Now, for Jack-O-Lantern, there was an obvious way we should have gone, but we didn't prepare well enough. We have no pumpkin in the house. (laughs) (laughs) So we couldn't make any pumpkin cocktails. On the other hand, do we really want to drink any pumpkin-flavored cocktails? Pumpkin-flavored I might be able to be okay with. The idea of cocktails made with pumpkin puree, which some of the ones we looked up Mm. had, uh, it's it's not my idea of a perfect texture. Yeah. Instead, I have gone for something that I made up myself, as I as I have a tendency to do. It is more of a fall cocktail, really, than a Halloween cocktail, because it's apple cider, rum, falernum, angostura bitters, and autumn bitters, which is another uh, type of dark bitters that we have. And I rimmed a glass with some apple cider and bitters and some, well, yellow sugar. I was going for orangey Halloweeny, but I didn't have any orange. So uh, yellow colored sugar, and I have a garnish of a cinnamon stick. So I'm going to try that now. Mm, yeah, spicy. Tastes like mulled cider, basically. Right. Rummy mulled cider. Mm, it has crunchy sugar. Okay, I'm happy. You talk about yours while I drink this. Well, I just went for a classic, I guess, a zombie. One of the million zombie recipes that you'll find if you uh, search the web. I looked for one that I had most of the ingredients for. <laughs> you only had to do minor tweaking. Yeah. The zombie The zombie is a very complicated uh, drink with lots of ingredients. So, yeah, I picked one and three different types of rum and some... Falernum and... Don's mix and lime juice and various other things, yeah. Yeah. In a tiki mug. Mm, spicy. Yeah, that'd be the Don's mm-hmm. mix. It's very strong. It's got cloves and. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is it good? Nice. Yeah. Very rummy. Very rummy. Yeah. Okay. So the zombie, obviously, for the Halloween associations. Indeed. <laughs> though you don't actually talk about it in this video. But no, it though I do have a video where I do mention the zombie, uh, but that's that's for another day. <laughs> All right. So speaking of the video, I think that we'll just go straight to that. So this is your jack-o'-lantern video. That's right. And you did it last year, just about this time. Yeah. So we'll listen to that and then we'll come back and discuss it and add some tidbits. Maybe talk a little bit more about some other Halloween-y spooky things. This is not going to be a scary podcast. However, we're not scary. Jack-o'-lantern is just a shortening of Jack of the Lantern, a guy with a light. Originally someone like a night watchman holding a lantern, it only later became a hollowed-out vegetable with a face carved into it used as a lamp, now most associated with Halloween. There's an Irish folk tale about the origin of the Jack-o'-lantern. The wicked reputation of a rakish hero known as Stingy Jack or Drunk Jack catches the devil's attention. To stop the devil taking his soul, Jack convinces the devil to turn himself temporarily into a coin so that he can buy one last drink. Remember, Jack is both drunk and stingy. Cleverly, he then slips the coin into his own pocket beside a cross, trapping the devil. Jack lets him go in exchange for being left alone for ten years, and when the devil returns, stingy Jack tricks him into climbing a tree to get one last apple, then traps him again by carving a cross into the tree. 
This time Jack makes the devil promise never to take his soul to hell. Soon after, Jack dies and the gates of heaven are closed to him because he's a sinner. But the devil can't take him into hell, so he is trapped wandering the earth forever. The devil gives him a coal from hell to light his way, which he carries in a hollowed out turnip as his only light. So that's one origin story, though it's probably more recent than the tradition it supposedly explains. But still, why is he called Jack? Jack is a pet name for John. Surprisingly, it doesn't seem to come from the French Jacques, which actually comes from Jacob, but is a diminutive of John with the suffix kin, so Jack means Little John. It became a generic name for an ordinary man in medieval Britain. Unsurprisingly then, the name is used for the hero of folk tales in England and in some parts of North America, particularly the Appalachians. Unlike the fairy tales with their princes, Jack tales always feature a lower class figure as the wily and cunning, but also sometimes bumbling, trickster figure. Think Jack the Giant Killer, or Jack and Jill, and expressions like Jack of All Trades, or Lumberjack. Oh, and there's the Jack in the deck of cards, which was originally known as the Knave, but because K for King and KN for Knave was confusing, the Knave was changed to Jack. There was a tradition in French playing cards for the face cards to represent specific historical people. For instance, the Jack of Diamonds was Hector from the Iliad, and the Jack of Clubs was Sir Lancelot. In some card games such as Euchre and Cribbage, the Jack, normally the lowest face card, is sometimes elevated to the highest, perhaps a reflection of the Jack hero whose cleverness beats his higher status opponents. So that explains the Jack element of Jack-o-Lantern. But what about the Lantern? Well, it comes from the Latin word Lanterna through Greek from Lampo, hence also the word Lamp, ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to burn or to shine. However, when Lampter goes from Greek to Latin, it gets the erna stuck on the end because of the similar Latin word lucerna, which also means lamp. It comes from the word lux, meaning light, which gives us the name Lucifer, one of the names for the devil, which brings us back to the story of Stingy Jack. Now you'll remember that Stingy Jack carries his light in a hollowed out turnip. The word turnip means literally a turned neep, as in the root vegetable called the neep, a Greek word meaning mustard which came to English through Latin, turned on a lathe, a machine used to carve things like table legs, referring to the turnip's round shape. So a jack-o'-lantern made from a turnip is, I suppose, doubly carved. When the jack-o'-lantern tradition moved to North America, brought over in part by Irish immigrants driven there by the failure of another root vegetable crop, the potato, where Halloween took on its modern form, and where it's still most commonly celebrated, the pumpkin replaced the turnip as the carving vegetable of choice. Well, they were readily available and a lot easier to carve. Gourds, such as pumpkins, squashes, and melons, by the way, seem to have been one of the first domesticated plants, and along with many other culinary and household uses, such as containers or musical instruments, have sometimes been used for lanterns. It's been pointed out, for instance, that the Maori word for gourd also means lampshade. The word pumpkin itself comes from a Greek word for melon, pepon, from the Proto-Indo-European root meaning to cook or ripen, and comes through Latin and French into English as pompion. Then the diminutive suffix kin, remember that suffix from the name Jack, was added. So a pumpkin means a little melon. Initially, the word was used for any edible gourd, but it now mostly refers to the orange North American squash. So that's where the term jack-o'-lantern comes from. But though the Stingy Jack story is filled with supernatural and creepy elements, what's the specific link to Halloween? Well, to start off with, the word Halloween means Hallow's Eve, the evening before All Hallow's Day. Hallow means saint, related to the word holy, coming from an Old English word and ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root which gives us words such as whole, hail, healthy, and holiday. The Christian All Hallowtide is the three-day festival to remember and pray for the dead, including all the saints without their own feast days and all good Christian souls. The saints and martyrs honored on All Saints Day were often asked to intercede for the souls of deceased loved ones in purgatory, earning their way into heaven. The beginning of All Saints Day was when Pope Boniface IV, on May 13, 609, reconsecrated the Pantheon at Rome, which had been a pagan temple, as a Christian church to Mary and the martyrs, and declared an annual festival in their honor. This is one of the first examples of what became a common procedure of the Christian church to absorb and repurpose pagan shrines and celebrations, turning them towards Christian worship. And the reason that Boniface chose that date, May 13th, may lie in a Roman festival of the dead called Lemuria. For the ancient Romans, Lemuria, which culminated on May 13th, was a festival to exorcise the restless and malevolent ghosts of the dead, and included a ritual of walking around the house in bare feet throwing black beans over the shoulder. These ghosts were known as Lemures. The great taxonomist Carl Linnaeus borrowed this Roman word for ghosts to name the primates lemurs, because of their nocturnal habits, though their ghostly appearance and cries, and the legend of the Malagasy people of Madagascar that lemurs were the souls of their ancestors, are a fitting coincidence. 
The Latin lemures were also known as larvae, a word related to lares, the Roman household gods, that could also refer to scary masks. Once again, Linnaeus picked up on the word larva in its mask sense to refer to the juvenile form of animals which mask their adult forms. But this scary mask sense fits well with our modern Halloween tradition of scary costumes. The Romans had another festival of the dead that contributes to the Halloween tradition, called Feralia, the final ceremony of the nine-day festival Parentalia starting February 13th, which honors the manes, which etymologically means good, the spirits of their ancestors, with offerings of food, drink, and flowers at their tombs outside the city's sacred boundaries. Now you'll remember that the annual celebration of the saints and the martyrs was first held on May 13th, not even close to modern Halloween. In the year 835, Pope Gregory III moved All Saints Day to November 1st, which happens to be the same date as the Irish Samhain, a pagan festival with its own supernatural aspects, eventually leading to the merging of the similarly themed festivals in the British Isles. Though it's uncertain if this is another example of Christian repurposing of a pagan festival, the date actually seems to have changed in Germanic and English areas before Celtic ones, the outcome of the merging of these two traditions is our next stop in the journey toward modern Halloween. Samhain is the Celtic seasonal festival that marks the end of the harvest, when the herd was brought in from the summer pasture and excess animals were slaughtered before winter. The word Samhain either means summer's end or comes from a root that means together. Though it's been argued that Samhain was a kind of Celtic New Year and a festival of the dead, the evidence is thin. Nevertheless, in addition to the pastoral and harvest associations, it does seem to have had supernatural associations, as a liminal or boundary time when spirits or fairies could cross over into the human world, and so may have developed rituals propitiating these spirits to protect people and livestock. A number of modern Halloween traditions may come, at least in part, from Samhain. Dressing up in scary disguises seems to have been a part of Samhain, either to blend in with the other spirits who were walking around, or to scare them off. Also, offerings of food or sweets to propitiate the gods or spirits may lie behind Halloween candy. Since Samhain came at the end of the harvest season and involved slaughtering animals, the bones and other agricultural refuse were burned in a bone fire, or bonfire, which may also have scared away evil spirits. Bonfires continue to be an autumn tradition, and specifically a Halloween custom in many places. In fact, almost the only element of Samhain ritual that we have good evidence for is the use of fire, and that may also lie behind the jack-o'-lantern tradition, which may have started as lights or lanterns in the window to ward off evil spirits. Also, Samhain was a time of prophecy, especially concerning marriage. Several rituals involved apples, either seeds or peels, and this comes down to us as bobbing for apples, also known as duking or ducking in some parts of Britain, or as snap apple in Ireland as well as in Newfoundland, where it survived as a popular name for Halloween, snap apple night and those apples are a link to another Roman influence on Halloween. It was the Romans who imported the domesticated apple tree to Britain, and along with it the celebration of the Roman goddess of fruit and orchards, Pomona, and her worship may be the origin of the apple rituals in Britain. But getting back to the development of modern Halloween, trick-or-treating may come in part from the disguises of Samhain, but it is also influenced by many other separate but related traditions. For instance, there's souling, going door-to-door -door in costumes during Hallowtide, carrying turnip lanterns representing the souls in purgatory, and offering blessings or songs in return for soul cakes. There's the Scottish and Irish tradition of guising, going door-to-door -door in costumes asking for handouts, and by the 19th century, geysers also used turnip lanterns. In England, there's mumming, an old tradition of costume dances and little plays performed at various seasons of the year, sometimes in public places, sometimes going door-to-door. -door. In northern counties of England, there's Mischief Night at the beginning of November when children played tricks and vandalized neighbors' houses. And then there's Guy Fox Night, November 5th, commemorating a failed plot to blow up the Parliament buildings, which is celebrated with bonfires and fireworks. Just before it, children would go door-to-door -door collecting pennies for the guy, that is, money to pay for the making and burning of an effigy of Guy Fox. Since the gunpowder plot was a Catholic conspiracy, Guy Fox Night was particularly popular in Protestant England, where it took over some of the elements of the Hallowtide festivities which had been suppressed by the Puritan rejection of saints' days and purgatory, while in Ireland and Scotland the earlier holidays remained strong. Indeed, all over the British Isles there are local events and celebrations around Hallowtide that feature some combination of these activities with elements of misrule, role reversal, and confusion of status, and all of them probably contributed to the development of the common modern practice of costumed small children asking for candy with the phrase trick-or-treat, which became widespread in North America around the beginning of the 20th century. So, trying to pin down any one source for any particular aspect of Halloween, like the jack-o'-lantern or trick-or-treating, is like following a will-o'-the-wisp through the darkness, and leaves us bogged down in confusing folktales, scraps of evidence, and modern rationalizations and made-up origin stories. Which is fitting, since another term for will-o'-the-wisp is, in fact, jack-o'-lantern. 
Actually, it turns out that a flickering light over a bog is an earlier meaning for jack-o'-lantern than its Halloween connection. There are in fact many names for this phenomenon, which is probably really produced by spontaneous ignition of methane coming from the decomposing vegetation of the bog, such as ignis fatus, meaning foolish fire, or corpse candles. The most well-known modern term, will-o'-the-wisp, was used especially in East England. Wisp means a bundle of straw, hence torch, so Jack of the Lantern and Will of the Torch are essentially the same. One folk explanation for the lights is that they are the wandering spirits of people who are being punished for moving landmarks or boundary stones in life. The bog light phenomenon is also associated with the mischievous spirit Puck or Puka, who leads travellers off the path to their death. Such mischievous spirits and tricksters, also known as fairies or hobgoblins, are of course perennial Halloween fixtures. Hobgoblin is itself an interesting word. The goblin part comes from a medieval Latin word that might go back to a Greek word meaning rogue or knave, like the playing card, and or might be cognate with kobold, the Germanic spirit that was thought to live in rocks and mines, and gives us cobalt for the mineral that is sometimes found mixed with silver ore, making it tricky and dangerous for miners to get out the valuable metal. This is parallel to the mineral name nickel, short for kupernickel, which means the devil's copper, since nickel mixed with copper ores made it hard to refine. Old Nick was a Germanic name for the devil, bringing us back to the story of Stingy Jack. And speaking of Jack, the hob part of Hobgoblin is a short form of Robin or Robert, commonly used as a generic name for a lower class guy, just like Jack. Hob also became a general name for a horse, and so also gives us Hobby, short for Hobby Horse, a character in those old mummers plays as well as being associated with mischievous spirits like Robin Goodfellow, also known as Puck, and trickster figures, which may have influenced Robin Hood's name. And don't forget his right-hand man, Little John. Or should that be Jack? So, Halloween can't be considered only pagan or only Christian. It's the interaction between the various customs and beliefs that seems to produce the modern traditions. And since the theme of all those customs was confusion, mischief, and breaking of boundaries, it's not surprising that the history of Halloween, and of the jack-o'-lantern, is itself full of confusion, false trails, and mixed-up cultures. So there's a lot in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it all fits into a sort of organic whole. Yes, just thinking about commenting on it and where to start. Mm. <laughs> Do you have anything that wasn't in there that you want to sort of clarify or talk a little bit more about? Yeah, there are a few little little details left on the table, I guess, that didn't make it into the video. So one little detail is that with the lemurs, the, the term was originally applied to the actually unrelated species, the slender loris, and only later applied to the Madagascar le lemurs. Um, but the name stuck with that, that, genus. that genus instead. Okay. And there's a sort of Canadian connection that I've sort of wondered about, and I don't know, I, I haven't sort of found more information about this since, but a number of the earliest references to various of these elements right. seem to have a Canadian background. So the term trick-or-treat seems to be first used in 1927 in Canada in an Alberta newspaper. Right. And the act of trick-or-treating, that is, going door-to-door, -door, mm -hmm. uh, is first mentioned in a Kingston, Kingston, Ontario, Ontario newspaper. In, by the name trick-or-treating, you mean? Not by the name trick-or-treating, but the act of going door-to-door. Oh, okay. Door. okay. And that dates from 1911. Mm -hmm. And the pumpkin, the first mention of the pumpkin as part of the Halloween tradition is, again, in Kingston in 1866. Right. So even though all of these things are associated, obviously, with... American Yeah, we tend to and, think of it as an American, American holiday, yeah. but a lot of these earliest references seem to be Canadian ones. Mm. And I, sus I speculate that this may have something to do with the fact that there's a lot of Scottish... Right, in Canada, in uh, Ontario in particular, though Alberta yeah. is funny for that. Alberta's a bit funny for that, yeah. That is interesting, but I don't know. I mean, it could just be a coincidence of what material survives. Yes, and also the the researcher who has done the most work looking, you know, trying to track down the, the, the background of the, of the modern Halloween. He's British born, but moved to Canada. Right. So, so that's the sources he might have had the best yeah. access to. Still interesting. So clearly it shows, though, that Canada was in on the ground floor of the North American tradition. Yes, There's definitely. There's no, no suggestion there that it's uh, earlier in the U.S. than in Canada. And I guess the, the last little 
detail I wanted to add is another Roman festival, the festival of uh, Robigalia, uh-huh. which uh, eventually, again, gets repurposed as a Christian holiday, Rogation Tide or the Rogation Days. Right. And as I understand it, the original Roman festival, Robigalia, was, uh, had to do with fertility. Yes. Crops, the safety of, your, of the crops. Yeah, yeah, not fertility exactly. It, the numen, the power that was being propitiated, was in fact the power of a grain blight, a particular okay. disease right. that affects grain. And so it was the god that was that right. disease that was being propitiated so that it wouldn't harm the crops. So it wasn't exactly fertility, but it was certainly about protecting the grain supply. Mm-hmm. Well, it, as I said, gets taken up as the Christian Mm -hmm. Rogation Days, uh, which has a connection to the saints. It it involves the litany of the saints. Well, Rogation would be asking. Asking, yeah. yeah. So that may be possibly where a connection lies to... um, But it's nowhere near in the calendar. In in the calendar, it's a completely different day. Yeah. Yeah. So just the idea that you're asking for intercession mm-hmm. from the saints. Right. And it involved walking the fields. Right. And walking the boundaries. Walking the boundaries yeah. of the fields. But like, I don't know, there's at least five or six Roman festivals that involve boundaries. Mm-hmm. They were really important. I mean, I think they're important to most agricultural people, but the Romans were big on boundaries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> very, very big on boundaries. They were very legally minded people and property ownership was important. Well, and the interesting thing is, although the Puritans suppressed a lot of the Christian holidays mm-hmm. as being too Catholic, mm-hmm. um, so Christmas and Thanksgiving and mm-hmm. All Saints Day, mm-hmm. uh, but they seem to go easy on the Rogation Tide uh, really? because it served a practical function of helping to mark the boundaries. Ah, okay. Right. And so it seems to have been allowed. Because I wouldn't have thought that intercession of the saints would be something they'd be really big on. No. (laughs) But, but right, so the boundary marking part. The boundary marking part of it. Interesting. Well, a couple of things struck me as I was listening that I wanted to mention. One, I know I've mentioned this before, but I just thought I should mention that my own father, who is of Scottish extraction and grew up in England or was was a child in England, remembers carving turnips for Halloween. Well, for... Mm-hmm. and uh, remembers it as being massively difficult. <laughs> Specifically remembers his mother carving them, yeah. not him doing it. And uh, yes, yeah, so he, he's definitely a convert to the pumpkin yes. approach. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, when you think about it, uh, you know, a turnip is a solid Yeah, it's vegetable. not hollow. It's not I mean, hollow. that's the real key here is it's <laughs> Pumpkins are great. They're already <laughs> mostly hollow. hollow. yeah. You don't have to do much work there. Another thing that pumpkin and your discussion of pumpkin... The word Mm. made me think of, I don't know if you noticed the little social media panic that was going around about maybe half a month ago now at the beginning of pumpkin spice latte season. Oh, yes, yes. About the canned pumpkin isn't really pumpkin, it's really squash. (laughs) And it was all very bizarre. And it was one of these things that I sort of noticed only in passing and barely followed up on. But there is, in fact, a whole Snopes.com page on this claim. What I thought was funny about it is, so the the thing that was going around was this post on Facebook and elsewhere, and then some articles got picked up. A bunch of people did articles on, oh, it's a lie when they say it's pumpkin in the canned pumpkin. It's not. It's really squash. It's Hubbard squash and butternut squash and a bunch of other things. And as Snopes points out, it's just nonsense because the point is, yes, what is in the canned pumpkin is not the same as the jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. Right. It is a specially bred pumpkin. The Snopes article doesn't go into the differences. It talks about the scientific, which mm. which varietal each of them is. But I'm glad it's a different pumpkin because, among other things, the pumpkins that we buy for doing jack-o'-lanterns make really bad pumpkin mm. pie. They're stringy. They're quite tasteless. They're bred for size. Yeah. They're bred to be big and hard so that you can carve them. Well, and if you do make your pumpkin pie from scratch the kind of pumpkin you buy to do that is already not the same already not the same they're the small ones known often as sugar sugar pumpkins or sugar pie pumpkins right now they're very similar they look they're orange they look the same but small but they're yeah they're already different the point as snopes goes into great detail talking about is that there is no one scientific definition of what a pumpkin is as opposed to a squash right they're interchangeable terms essentially But, in fact, there are four different types of squash that are generally considered to be pumpkin, and this is one of the varietals of one of those types, is the one that's used in the canned pumpkin. Right. And it's not butternut squash, and it's not Hubbard squash, and it's, you know, it's... 
Anyway, it's all completely ridiculous. But it just made me think of that when you were talking about the, the naming and right. and the fact that for whatever reason, I mean, this information has been out there for years and there's been articles run on it. But for some reason this year, it was an expose and it was a big <laughs> deal. And everybody was all upset about it. And people were writing letters to the biggest canned pumpkin manufacturer or a canner and demanding to know what it really was and whether it was really squash or really pumpkin. So it just shows the power of words, I suppose. Yes. And marketing. A pumpkin mm. by any other name would taste as sweet. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So that was my point about pumpkins. Another thought struck me as you were talking about masks and you mentioned the word larvae or larva. Yeah. And that it means masks. And it made me think of another Roman mask that didn't make it into the video. And I don't remember if we even talked about it, but the Romans did have a particular use for masks beyond the theatrical masks. Right. And in particular, masks of the dead. Mm. They, yes. Right? Death masks. They yeah. had the death masks, the imagines. Mm -hmm. So an imago was probably made of wax. They basically don't survive, but we're told that they were wax masks made of dead people of the of when someone died. Though it's unclear whether these things were actually death masks actually made right. on them or just made after the fact and... Often people had them of very old ancestors, and there's a good chance that they were not actually mm. from the period. But anyway, the idea was that they were masks of notable family members who had died, male family members, and they would be hung in the atrium, the front public area of a Roman home. And to have imagines was to be noble, was to be in the not only in the upper classes, but the upper classes with family. Right. With long family history, because you didn't have imaginates of just any old family member. It was people who had been important, who had been consuls, who had held office, who had been great generals, whatever. So the number of imaginates you had hanging in your hallway would be a marker of status. But more than that, they would hang there no normally. But when there was a funeral, the imaginates would be taken down and worn by paid mourners or by members of the family, but usually by paid mourners who would impersonate the people that they were and walk in the procession wearing whatever marks of status and the toga that was appropriate to them and everything of the people who had died and would walk in the funeral as if they were those members come back to life. So they were death masks, but they were also ghosts. Right. Really? And there was, in fact, a the actual dead person would also be sometimes impersonated at the funeral. So the person who was actually being mourned. Mm. And I was reminded of that fact, actually, by Hagrid Hawks posting the word right. archmime, yes, archmime, right. which is one of the terms for somebody whose profession was to impersonate the dead. And they were supposed to not just wear their mask, they were supposed to impersonate their walk, their voice, their gestures, and to, to be as close as they could. And apparently not only of the dead, immediately dead person, but of the great ancestors. So exactly how that worked and how there was sort of an oral tradition or what of how you would know somebody died 200 years ago and what, how to impersonate them and hmm. how anyone would be able to tell. I don't know. These, yeah. these details are not left to us. But I was reminded of that. Um, and if you wonder who Hagrid Hawks is, listen to our last podcast That's right. <laughs> to find out about uh, interesting and obscure words. Anyway, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. That's, in some ways, a very unconnected use of masks, but in other words, very Halloween-y. True. It wasn't thought of as scary or spooky, but I've got to say, I sometimes think that walking into a Roman atrium at night, lit only by oil lamps with these wax masks of dead people hanging mm. on the wall, <laughs> must have been rather creepy, actually. But it's, it's, I guess, a bit more reminiscent of what lies behind Samhain and this connection mm -hmm. with the dead. And... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and like the Days of the Dead. Mm -hmm. Day of the Dead. Yes. And I mean, in other ways, it's just like any English manor house with the portraits of the previous holders of the title hanging in their you know banquet hall or whatever. Right. All the previous earls of right. such and such a place going yeah. back 50, 100, 200, 500 years. Mm -hmm. However far you could go back, if it went back to the Norman Conquest or beyond, you know, that's what shows your status. So it, it's not really that different from portraits, but still, and there's something particularly Halloween-y about it, I think. And now, as an extra Halloween treat, Avon is going to read for us a poem, Horus Satire 1-8, which is in the voice of... The god Priapus, a wooden statue of the god Priapus who's in a garden in Rome. 
I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards, but I think it's appropriately Halloween-y. Priapus, from which we get the word priapism. And priapic, yes. And you will soon see why. <laughs> I suppose I should put a slight language warning on this. <laughs> so it's not the language, really. It's the imagery. I think you'll be okay. I was once a fig tree's trunk, a lump of useless wood, till the carpenter, uncertain whether to carve priapus or a stool, decided on the god. So I'm a god, the terror of thieves and birds. My right hand keeps the thieves away, along with the red shaft rising obscenely from my groin, while the reed stuck on my head frightens naughty birds, and stops in settling here in Mycenas's new gardens. Once slaves paid to have the corpses of their fellows cast from their narrow cells brought here in a cheap box. This was the common cemetery for a mass of paupers, like that joker Pantolibus and the wastrel Nomentanus. Here a pillar marked a width of a thousand feet for graves, three hundred deep, ground not to be passed to the heirs. Now you can live on a healthier Esquiline and stroll on the sunny rampart where sadly you used to gaze at a grim landscape covered with whitened bones. Personally, it's not the usual thieves and wild creatures who haunt the place that cause me worry and distress. As those who trouble human souls with their drugs and incantations, I can't escape them or prevent them from collecting bones and noxious herbs as soon as the wandering moon has revealed her lovely face. I've seen Canidia myself, wandering barefoot with her black robe tucked up and disheveled hair, howling with the elder Sagana, pallor making them hideous to view. They scraped at the soil with their nails, then set to tearing a black lamb to bits with their teeth. The blood ran into the trench so they might summon the souls of the dead, spirits to give them answers. There was a woolen doll there and another of wax. The wool one was larger to torment and crush the other. The wax one stood like a suppliant, waving, waiting slave-like for death. One of the witches cried out to Hecate, the other to cruel to Siphone. You might have seen snakes and hellhounds wandering around, a blushing moon hiding behind the tall tombs so as not to be witness. If I'm lying, foul my head with white raven's droppings, and let Julius, Slim Pedacia, and that thief Varenus come here and shit and piss all over me. Why tell every detail? How the spirits made shrill, sad noises as they conversed with Sagana, how the two witches stealthily buried the beard of a wolf and the tooth of a spotted snake, how the wax doll made the fire blaze more brightly, and how I shuddered, a witness to the twin fury's words and deeds, but had my revenge. My buttocks of fig wood split with a crack as loud as the sound of a bursting bladder, and off they ran to the city. You'd have been laughing and cheering to see Canidia's false teeth drop and Sagana's tall wig, herbs and magical love knots tumbling from their arms. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, that, that sort of, I mean, just the setup of it reminds me of the Dream of the Rude. Oh, yeah? Well, I mean, it's... it's oh, that it's the wood it's speaking. The, this wood or Anglo-Saxon uh, riddles. It's this wood saying, I was, you know, piece of wood say, talking about how it was made into a thing. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. The dream of the wood being the... Anglo-Saxon poem uh, um, that's in the voice of the cross on which Christ was crucified. Right, right. Yeah, and maybe it, you know, the dream of the for may well... Well, I don't know if it's coming off of this poem exactly, but that uh, I think there is a whole genre of sort of statues and items right, okay. who speak. It's a lot of little elegies or um, epigrams right, of okay. stat that would sort of be appended to statues and things like that right. that would sort of be in the voice of the statue. Hmm. A little bit like gravestones that and grave markers that call out to the passerby, right. you know, come and see me. But yeah, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> this one, of course, not quite as reverent. No. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think this poem is nearly often enough talked about because I think it's really quite amazing. <laughs> it is quite. There's something very modern about it almost. Mm -hmm. I should give credit for the translation, by the way, to uh, this is not my translation. It's on A.S. Klein's website. Right. I use his website a lot. He has translation of a lot of poetry, various different languages. But the Latin translations, it's poetryintranslation.com, and I recommend it highly. Uh, some of the yeah. poems are quite well annotated, others are not, but they're good, readable, mm -hmm. generally pretty accurate translations of Latin poetry. Yeah, I've used uh, his stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I should make sure to say that. And he lets anybody use it, which is great. So the satires are comedy. I mean, they're, or not always, but many of the poems are humorous. And this is obviously a very humorous poem. But I thought it was a Halloween-y because of its combination of play. Yeah. And witchcraft and, and, you know, sort of the, the terror of the dead. 
And also the idea of Priapus and the way he scares off the witches, which is this idea that laughter is protective, that laughter is apotropaic. It right. drives away evil, which is really, really important in the ancient world. There's all sorts of stuff. And in particular, in Roman culture, big phalluses are apotropaic. They drive away evil for a bunch of reasons. But one of the reasons is because they make you laugh. Mm -hmm. They're ridiculous. And Priapus is always shown with a penis that's like not just obscene, but ridiculous right. in its size. And it's funny. Mm -hmm. It's not sexy. <laughs> it's funny. And this idea that laughter drives away evil spirits is obviously intricately linked, I think, to the idea of Halloween. Yeah, and, and that may go back to the uh, Samhain mm -hmm. kind of background to, to Halloween. Mm -hmm. But I think it builds on something that's there in, other, in, in many cultures, mm -hmm. uh, not unique to it at all. The idea that you drive away fearsome things in part by ri ridicule, yeah. by, being, yeah. by being funny, and by laughter, that laughter is something that the uncanny doesn't handle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the witches are scared by something that's funny. They're scared by a big fart at the end. Right. I mean, that's the, the point. But it's not just that they're scared by a loud noise. They're scared by his ridiculousness. It's that laughter that drives them away. Right. And then the whole poem becomes in itself an apotropaic thing because the whole poem is funny. And when you read the poem, you laugh. Right. And then you drive away ill luck. Right. The ill luck that the witches would bring otherwise so it becomes it sort of enacts what it describes yeah i mean that is one of the the recurring themes in in the jack-o-lantern video mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was uh, this sort of misrule and boundary breaking mm -hmm. indeed that is encompassed in this dressing up mm -hmm. exactly and the, you know the setup here in this poem is that it used to be a pauper's grave and then Mycenas, second in command to Augustus, bought the land and turned it into a public park. And isn't that wonderful because he's repurposed something that was macabre and turned it into a benefit to the people of Rome. And so the poem also has this whole underlying praise of Augustus and praise of, and praise of Mycenas, who is Horace's patron. Right. So it's also praising the guy who gives you the money right. poem. But that also, I think, is also a Halloween thing because it's essentially about taking control over the liminal places and making them into civic, integrating them into civic life. This is a graveyard and these are witches and those are terrifying things. They are places of the border between life and death and the breaking of rules, but they have been tamed and civilized and brought under the roof of the city and brought into public life. And now the witches are in a poem and they're contained by this humorous poem. So we can have the witches, but not be scared by them. And we can have the graveyard, but now it's a public park. And that's really what Halloween is, too, especially in its modern version. Yeah, It's taking something scary out of the shadows and putting it on the streets. And now that we have, you know, six-year-olds dressing up as ghosts and witches, yeah. that fearsome idea is undercut. is undercut and under control and in reintegrated into mm -hmm. daily life so that we can all scare ourselves with horror stories and horror movies and then wake up the next day knowing everything's okay at least in, mm -hmm. in theory. So that, that civic integration of those liminal spaces, I think is actually also really what's going on in that poem. It's a silly poem, but it's, it really is enacting something that I think, think is really culturally important. Yeah. So if you want more Halloween goodies, why don't you check out our latest video in honor of Halloween on the word costume which is out now. So go to youtube.com slash alliterative and you can see costume, which touches on Halloween costumes, but also is a larger history of fashion and the language of fashion. And fashion as a language. And one last programming note. The next episode, we're going to talk about the Dirk Gently books by Douglas Adams, both about the two books, Dirk Gently's Detective Agency. Dirk Gently's Holistic, Holistic Detective, Detective Agency. Agency, sorry, and The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, but also about the upcoming adaptation of those books for BBC America. Yes. So as we're recording, it hasn't yet come out, but by the time you're listening to this, the first episode will have aired. On BBC America, On and BBC hopefully America. we'll have been able to watch it. Yeah. I think it will be available to purchase as well through iTunes. So we thought we would talk about 
those books, about that adaptation, and also about... The previous uh, BBC adaptation. So just to let you know, in case you haven't read those books and want to, we'll try to talk about it in such a way that if you haven't read the books and have no interest in doing so, you'll still be able to follow along and we'll explain what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about some of the ideas in the books and also about the process of adaptation, I think. Yeah. But if you have read the books and wanted to refresh your memory, or if you do want to read the books or don't want to hear us talking about it until after you've read the books, you may want to wait because there will be spoilers. Anyway, just to let you know that that's upcoming if you want to be prepared at all. We could call it homework, but that would, <laughs> but that doesn't seem right. <laughs> but there you go. Now you know your homework. So that'll be the next episode, Dirk Gently. But as for now, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.